Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> what a wonderful and beautiful crowd you are. And can people hear me in the back before I get started? OK, great. Welcome, everyone. I'm Michelle Tracy Berger, and I'm the relatively new director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities. And I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event. The Baker Nord Center is the intellectual and social hub for amplifying the arts and humanities here at Case Western. Our mission is to support the arts and humanities through fellowships, grants, symposia, and public-facing programming. We also, in conjunction with our many community partners, direct and organize the Cleveland Humanities Festival that our event tonight is a part of. We are deeply appreciative of working in collaboration with our on-campus colleagues at the Schubert Center for Child Studies that have helped to make tonight's presentation possible. This is the eighth year of the Cleveland Humanities Festival. It is always themed, and this year's theme is wellness. Just a bit of housekeeping. The book being discussed this evening is for sale outside of the ballroom. There will be a post-talk book signing immediately following our program at the front here. And if you haven't joined our mailing list, I encourage you to do so. We've made it really easy. There's a QR code set up in the back for you to do it. The Humanities Festival has just gotten underway, and we'd love to see you at some more of our events. So now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Lisa Damore. Lisa Damore is an advisor to the Schubert Center for Child Studies and a clinical instructor in the Department of Psychological Services. She is author of numerous academic papers, chapters, and books related to education and child development, including her recent New York Times bestsellers, Untangled, Guiding Teenage Girls Through the Seven Transitions into Adulthood, and Under Pressure, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls. She also hosts the very popular Ask Lisa podcast and is a regular contributor to the New York Times and CBS News. In her talk tonight, Dr. Damore will discuss her latest book, also a New York Times bestseller, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers Raising Connected, Capable, and Compassionate Adolescents. Please help me welcome Dr. Lisa Damore to the stage. Thank you for that gracious introduction. Um, thank you to the Cleveland um, Humanities Festival, to the Baker Nord Center for having me, to the Schubert Center, um, of which I'm so proud to be a part. And thank you all for giving up some of your afternoon evening to be with us, to think about teenagers. Teenagers are my favorite. Anyone who wants to talk about teenagers is my favorite. So I am delighted you are all here. So I'm going to start with sort of the conventional beginning, which is why I wrote this book. Um, I wasn't, there goes a balloon. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I have no idea where it came from. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the conventional of why I wrote this book. You gonna get it? I know, you got, all right, all right, fantastic. Um, there are two major forces behind the impetus to write this book. First of all, obviously, was the pandemic. I have cared for teenagers for nearly 30 years now, and I don't have to tell you, I have never seen anything like that in terms of its impact on teenagers, actually all of us, but teenagers in particular. Um, teenagers have two jobs. They're supposed to become increasingly independent and to spend as much time with their friends as possible, and the pandemic undermined their ability to do either of these jobs. That was the least of what teenagers suffered with. Then, of course, there was incredible diversity in how teenagers suffered, some suffering much more than others. And of course, kids who were already living under difficult conditions or in highly strained families suffered the most. The second reason I wrote this book had to do with something that was happening before the pandemic and that it seemed to accelerate through the pandemic, which is that there was a growing, there still is a growing chasm between how the popular culture talks about what mental health is and how psychologists understand mental health. 
And what I mean by that is that so often in the discourse, whether it's the newspapers or social media, so often what I see equated is this idea that you know you're mentally healthy or you know your kid's mentally healthy if there's a sense of feeling good or calm or relaxed or at ease. Um, happiness also comes up a lot now. And psychologists like these things. We have nothing against people feeling good or calm or relaxed or happy, but they actually don't figure into how we assess mental health and how we think about it. When psychologists think about mental health, we're actually looking at two things. One is whether the feelings that are being had actually fit the circumstance the person is in, even if those feelings are negative or unwanted. So that's the first assessment. The second is, how are the feelings managed? Are they managed in ways that bring relief and do no harm, or are they managed in ways that actually turn out to be problematic? To use a very you know, sort of straightforward example, imagine that your teenager has a dear best friend, and they, I, I'm aware, I'm actually gonna take a quick pause on the technical stuff. Are you all hearing as much feedback as I'm hearing? Okay, do you think it's because I have two mics up here? Okay, I just wanna make sure if there's something you need me to do. Okay, so you'll sort it out. I just wanted to make sure that that was good. All right, so to take a very straightforward example, imagine a teenager who has a dear best friend and they hang out all the time and they love each other and they're just, you know, together constantly. And then the teenager gets the news that their fr best friend is moving away. Okay, we would expect to see sadness. We would fully expect that there would be an upset young person in this moment. We would never in that moment take that distress as a sign that something was wrong with that young person. We would actually see it as evidence that they work perfectly. So that's check the first box, the feeling that fits the moment. Second, there's the question of how does the feeling get handled? And for psychologists, this is really where the rubber hits the road. This is what we're gonna to want to assess. So the kinds of things that we want to see are adaptive strategies that bring relief and do no harm. So for us, that means things like weeping, like actually psychologists like crying. Um, crying actually brings relief, calms the central nervous system, is a low cost, actually no cost way to manage stress. Um, we would want to see things, if it's a teenager especially, you'll see things like they'll put on their sad playlist and cry along to it. I promise you, most teenagers have a sad playlist and an angry playlist. And I was recently collecting um, playlist names from teenagers on the negative side, and one kid was like, I have a low-key devious playlist. <laughs> and I was like, good for you, good for you. So they'll listen to music that helps them express the negative feeling. Um, she may then want to take a break from feeling upset and get a little rest from it. So she might go watch some TV. She's probably going to go watch right now, go watch Gilmore Girls. Like Gilmore Girls is back. It was... It was Gilmore Girls and then Grays, and now we're back to Gilmore Girls. So that's often watched. And then she might make plans to get together with a friend. And all of these are what we want to see. This is exactly what mental health looks like, having a feeling that makes sense and then managing it well. We only get concerned if the management of the emotion is problematic. So we only get concerned if coping is costly. So we worry about a teenager who gets very upset and is like, you know what, the solution is to smoke a ton of weed until this feeling dies down, right? That will work in the short term, cause all sorts of trouble down the line. We worry about teenagers who routinely manage to stress by making everybody else upset, right? If I'm miserable, we're all gonna be miserable. And they sort of take it out in that way. And we worry about teenagers who turn against themselves when they're in distress, dislike themselves, don't take good care of themselves, or harmful to themselves. So we think in those ways about what we're looking for when we talk about mental health. And I was so honored to be invited under the umbrella of wellness for this theme for this year, because the way psychologists define wellness isn't how I think people often expect us to define wellness. It's not for us about being peaceful, being at ease, being happy, being relaxed. It's about having the capacity to manage distress effectively, having your resources, your emotional resources equal to the emotional tax that you run into. Okay, so the key here is to actually tease apart the experience of being in distress from the experience of having a mental health concern. And I wanna spend some time on things that need to be teased apart now more than ever. One thing that we are all watching unfold in front of us is a very interesting media landscape about adolescence and mental health. It is covered constantly. 
It is covered in ways that are at times harrowing. And one of the things I am always aware of as I watch these headlines come one after another is how often distress and mental health concern are spoken about as though they are the same. So one thing we want to just be really, really clear about in our own minds is that distress on its own is not something psychologists consider to be grounds for a mental health concern. In fact, and this is going to feel like a leap, but the examples are very straightforward. For us, often, distress is evidence of mental health. So in fact, 180 from much of the cultural discourse. So for example, best friends moving away, we expect to see sadness. Sadness is distress, it fits the moment perfectly. Another kind of easy example is, um, say a kid has a huge test in a day or two and they have not started studying. We would want to see anxiety under those conditions. We would be more concerned about the absence of anxiety than its presence. Similarly, if someone's really mean to a kid, we would expect that kid to feel hurt and then feel kind of self-protectively angry. So for psychologists, we're actually surprisingly agnostic on whether an emotion is negative or positive. Like that doesn't really matter much to us. What we're interested in is how well it fits the circumstance. And so often we truly welcome distress into our lives and the lives of the young people we care for because we know that it fits the picture and is evidence that that young person works perfectly. So to tease this apart a little further, distress versus mental health concern, we should articulate exactly what constitutes a mental health concern. So psychologists worry under a couple of conditions. One, not if mood goes up and down in a teenager, we fully expect to see that, but if mood goes to a concerning place and stays there, we don't expect to see that. And we don't expect that dark mood or that anxious mood to get in the way of a young person's life. So we expect sadness, we expect nerves, we do not expect so much sadness or so much anxiety that it interferes with going to school or seeing friends or doing the things that you're supposed to do. So that's when we know there's a mental health concern on board. And then of course, the other kind that we worry about is when coping is costly. A young person is managing, but the way they are managing is gonna cause trouble over time, whether they're abusing substances, being hard on others, or being hard on themselves. Okay, so that's one thing to tease apart. Now, there's another thing that we wanna tease apart that very much reflects the moment where we are culturally, which is we do not want to equate uncomfortable and unmanageable. And these are categories that have increasingly been collapsed around us. Okay, so there's many reasons why we do not want to equate these two things, uncomfortable and unmanageable. The first is that if we equate the two, if anything that is seen as uncomfortable is considered to be unmanageable, the almost invariable upshot of that is that you're going to see a lot of avoidance, right? That thing is uncomfortable. I cannot manage it. I'm not going to do it. Interesting to me, as I watch these headlines after headlines after headlines about teenagers, what I'm not seeing are the headlines about the thing I'm really hearing about, which is kids not going to school now. If you talk to any district across every socioeconomic range, what they will tell you is that they've had an enormous surge in chronic absenteeism, school truancy, school refusal, like it goes by different names. Now, why kids aren't going to school differs based on the child, differs based on their circumstances, but this is actually, I think in some ways, the untold story of the post-pandemic world is that a lot fewer kids are actually showing up physically at school. For a lot of these kids, not all of these kids, the issue is avoidance, that they have come to feel that school is uncomfortable and so then it feels for them unmanageable and then they don't go. So one thing that I, all want you, I want you all to know, and this is just me talking as a psychologist, is that one of the most fundamental concepts that is fully established in our field is that avoidance feeds anxiety. And if I could rent billboards and airplanes with banners behind them, this is what I would put up on the billboards. Avoidance feeds anxiety, avoidance feeds anxiety. All right, here's how this works. If any one of us, but we'll center on a young person, let's say a teenager is feeling anxious about socializing. So we'll keep it away from school for a minute. And let's say that teenager has been invited to an event that they should go to, right? It's a friend's party, someone they like, you know, it's a totally reasonable thing to do. And let's say they feel anxious about it. 
So maybe they've accepted the invitation, but then the day comes and their anxiety starts to rise. And then let's say that teenager says, you know what, never mind, I'm just not going to go, right? And the adult on the scene says, okay, fine, it's a party, you don't have to go. All right, two things happen instantly that are a big problem. The first thing is the teenager instantly feels way better, right? As they were thinking about the party, they're getting more and more anxious, more and more concerned. And then they're like, or I just don't go. Whoosh, the anxiety drains away. All right, you all know this intro psych. This is a reinforcing experience, right? You're going to want to do it again because it felt so good. The second thing that happens is that whatever they were imagining about how bad or scary or frightening or worrisome that party was going to be, is now sealed in amber. They don't actually show up and see that, oh, it's not so bad, or it's fine, or you know, I know a few people and I don't mind talking to them. It just stays totally unchallenged by reality. Okay, now, if the thing they've avoided is school, a third thing happens, and it happens fast. As soon as a kid misses, like, literally a day of school, they are out of the loop a bit socially and they are out of the loop a bit academically, which makes it that much harder to go to school the next day. So avoidance feeds anxiety under any condition and actually feeds itself. The more you avoid, the more you avoid. And then for school, it's actually an accelerated process. Okay, so just as the principle is incredibly well understood in psychology, like there's no debate about this in our field, the treatment is also very, very much agreed upon. The technical term we use is exposure, Basically, you got to go. You got to go. And we use graduated exposure, meaning you don't have to go all at once. You could also use the term baby steps. So anytime you or someone you know is using avoidance to manage anxiety, the key thing you want to remember is it's going to make it worse very, very quickly. And the solution is actually to engage. And that may mean going to the first period and then going home, right? Or hanging out in the parking lot with an adult until you feel you can go in the building. But any degree of engagement is actually more powerful and more effective than staying home. Okay, so that's the first problem with collapsing unmanageable and uncomfortable is that we see too much avoidance and we're seeing a lot right now. The second problem when you collapse the two is it actually doesn't honor people who are in truly unmanageable situations. And this is something I think about a lot as a psychologist, because I observe how the culture has come to use technical and clinical terms in pretty elastic ways. And I try not to be too fussy about this and seem like a curmudgeon, but I always like feel myself bristle when the term trauma is thrown into a conversation. And mostly I try to be forgiving about it. Like, you know what, people are allowed to use words, like they're not all psychologists, they don't have to have the strict technical definitions that we use. But you do hear trauma used quite a bit to talk about an uncomfortable thing or an unwanted thing. And I'll live with that. But I also, I'm not gonna let you leave without you knowing exactly how psychologists define it and when we use it and why we use it. So for us, trauma is never the thing, it's never the event. Trauma is the interaction of the event and who it landed on. Because what will traumatize one person might not traumatize another. And we've known this for decades, the way we've studied this, looking at people coming back from war, people who've been in the same platoon going through the same horrible situation. Some will come back fully traumatized, other will come back very, very upset. And for us, trauma is an event that outmatches the coping of the individual to whom the event occurs. That's what a trauma is. So we can't really ever call anything a trauma, though there are some things that are bad enough that we just go ahead and do it, because we need to know who they landed on. Okay, so why does this matter? If we call everything that is uncomfortable unmanageable, we are actually losing track of the fact that some people really do live under unmanageable situations, and we're losing fat track of that reality. That can either be people who are facing traumas, right, that totally outmatch their coping, or things that are so overwhelming they would outmatch anybody's coping, so we can go ahead and assume they are traumatic. Or it can be people who are up against subtler and more constant things, the drip, drip, drip of racism or prejudice or bias that over time absolutely wears down coping. 
We want to be always thinking in terms of coping and who it's happening to and how it's happening and scale. And so when we collapse those, when we equate uncomfortable and unmanageable, we actually make two errors at once. First, we actually talk in general about people as though they're more fragile than they are. Humans are actually built to withstand a surprising amount of distress. And second, we really do not honor the fact that there are some individuals who actually face incredibly harrowing circumstances, big and overwhelming ones, or who live under situations that are chronically stressful and harmful and that are gonna undo them over time. Okay, now there's another tension that I want us to think through as we try to navigate the moment in adolescent mental health. And this is something I also am just observing all the time. There's the tension of wanting to call all of our you know, focus to the fact that we are in an adolescent mental health crisis. Right? You, this is in the news, we are talking about it. It is very, very real. And we are seeing headline after headline about the adolescent mental health crisis. But the thing we also have to be careful about is not to overwhelm people so much that they become paralyzed, right? That the data don't actually start to flood us and cause us to shut down or want to avoid the situation ourselves. And I think it's tricky. I think that this can be a really difficult tension to manage. And sometimes we get data that are very, very concerning and we need to share them, but we also want people to stay engaged and to stay involved. So the way that I think about managing this tension is to try to bring a public health lens to it. And I'm gonna walk you through what I mean. But the reason that I like a public health lens is I feel like it does two things at once. Number one, it keeps me from feeling overwhelmed. If you spend all day thinking about adolescent mental health and reading the papers, it's pretty easy to start to feel overwhelmed. Second, the public health lens means that every one of us in this room has a job to do. So you're leaving with jobs to do. Okay, so to describe the public health lens, I find it's easier for me to wrap my hands around it if I don't think about mental health but actually, if I think about dental health, truly, okay. So if we think in a dental health perspective on public health, we think in primary, secondary, and tertiary forms of prevention, and I'm actually gonna start with tertiary. So tertiary describes when there's already a problem and then it needs to be fixed and kept from getting worse. So in dental terms, it's a cavity, right? So if a young person has a cavity, Tertiary prevention, you fill the cavity, you make sure it doesn't get worse, you get that tooth back to health. Secondary prevention is where there's a risk of a problem developing. So maybe a kid who's eating a ton of sweets. And so in dental health, secondary prevention, we notice kids who are actually bending towards ill health and we actually try to redirect them. Primary prevention in public health terms when we think in terms of dental health, is fluoride in the water, right? That there's something that we do that goes to everyone to try to protect their overall health. Okay, so that's our dental health version of this. Cavities, cavity prevention for kids who are at high risk, fluoride for everybody. So if we take that and we move it over to mental health, it's just an accident that they rhyme, but it's, I appreciate it. Let's think first about the tertiary side of this equation. So tertiary are what do we do for kids who are already suffering from mental health concerns? And we have a lot of kids suffering from mental health concerns. And it gets us to something that, again, has not gotten discussed very much as we talk about the crisis in adolescent mental health. There were really two causes of it. One was the surge in distress among teenagers, right? The pandemic was horrible. It made many teenagers who were fine completely unhappy and kids who were struggling really into some pretty dire and scary circumstances. So we had this huge uptick in terms of how many kids were suffering. The undiscussed side of this is we don't actually have a lot of people who see teenagers. This is highly, highly specialized work. Not everybody is interested in it. And to do it, you actually need a lot of training because teenagers are tricky and you're working across different systems and you're, they're not quite adults and they're not quite kids and they're brought in by adults, but you can't tell them things. I mean, it's, it's a complicated clinical world. And so the thing that didn't get nearly enough coverage as we're talking about the adolescent mental health crisis is we don't have a workforce that can actually meet the need. 
the workforce for caring for teenagers was actually pretty stretched thin before the pandemic. And it wasn't as though when the pandemic hit, we could magically like produce thousands of new people who were seasoned at seeing teenagers. So if we think now about tertiary concerns and kids who are already struggling, there's a couple of things for us to focus on. So one is, I know we have some students in the room. And what I want to say to you is if you're thinking about caring for teenagers for a living, let me recommend it, right? I adore them. They are incredibly fun to treat. And the best thing about teenagers is they get better faster than anybody else. The wonder of caring for teenagers, and one of my colleagues said this, he's like, you know what? We get way too much credit for our work with teenagers. And it is true. I have cared for teenagers who in October were cut in class, didn't care about anything, deep into all sorts of trouble, who truly, with not a lot of work on my part, something shifts, something realigns, they get an idea about what they want to have happen next in their life, and suddenly they are deep into school or deep into an activity that they can take and that's going to be a real rudder for them as they move forward in life. So I strongly recommend on the tertiary side that we think very much about encouraging more and more people to move into the work of caring for teenagers and helping them to be good clinicians in that place. The other thing we can do, and this is for those of us who are already in the field, we have to think very, very hard about the pipeline of clinicians of color. One of the things we are always lacking in number, and then I think became even more dire in the pandemic, is enough clinicians who have lived experience that can reflect the needs of our very diverse clientele. And there are a lot of leaks in the pipeline for clinicians of color, and one of the things those of us who are in the field can be doing is thinking very, very hard about how do we plug those leaks, how do we get more clinicians into the pipeline so that we can de deliver more clinicians of color down the line. Okay, the second thing we're gonna do, this is into secondary prevention. This is the dental health, eating too many sweets, mental health, when it's time to start worrying about somebody, is we are not gonna equate distress with a mental health concern. We're not doing that we are going to be very alert to the signs that something's wrong. Okay, so how do you know something is starting to bend in a worrisome direction with a teenager? So one, like I said, recognize mood that is stuck in a place that it shouldn't be, right? It's not going up and down. Two, as I mentioned, recognizing costly coping. And primarily, I want you to add into your awareness of what costly coping is, avoidance. We're not spending nearly enough time, I think, getting on avoidance early when we see it. And as soon as avoidance starts, it quickly grows. So part of what we can do as adults who surround teenagers is to have a very, very watchful eye for coping that is problematic or kids whose moods are not varying or as they should. The other thing I wanna add here, and this feels to me like, again, if I could have all the billboards in the world, I would also get this billboard. One thing we want to be mindful of is that depression in teenagers does not always look like depression in adults. And this is something that a lot of people don't know. Some teenagers do have a more kind of classical depression where they look low mood or blank um, or lacking in all motivation. Teenagers uniquely will express depression in terms of being very, very irritable or angry, or short-tempered, or impatient with people. And it is very common that a teenager who is depressed, to me when I've cared for them clinically, either on inpatient or outpatient work, what they feel like is a porcupine. Like if you get near them, you're always gonna run into something spiky and uncomfortable. And I sort of feel like us in the world of trying to be public health stewards of young people, if you could help me get the word out that a teenager who is prickly with their parents, prickly with their school, prickly with their siblings, doesn't even, you know, gets rubbed the wrong way by their friends, that is not a typical adolescent and that's not even a snarky adolescent. That is almost always a teenager who is suffering from depression and needs to be evaluated and treated as such. Okay, now we get to the fluoride, the fun part. So fluoride for teenagers, when we think about their mental health, Here's the thing I want you to know, most important thing I'm gonna to say to you tonight. The single most powerful force for mental health in teenagers is strong relationships with caring adults. 
We have proved this over and over again. It's great if there are adults in the home, but they don't have to be adults in the home. So all of you are caring adults. All of you have teenagers somewhere in your orbit. Maybe it's your kid, maybe it's your nieces or nephews or your grandchildren, maybe it's somebody you mentor, maybe it's a neighbor's kid, maybe it's somebody who works for you. When I think about how we're gonna get ourselves through and out of this adolescent mental health crisis, I don't think it's gonna be more therapy for more kids. That's actually not a practical solution. What it's gonna be is the adults who are surrounding teenagers stepping up and making incredibly powerful connections with them. Okay, so let's talk about exactly what that looks like on the ground. So it's hard when a teenager gets upset, right? It's very worrisome to see a teenager in distress. Their emotions are very powerful. They can be unsettling for the teenager and unsettling for us. Going forward, I want you to be watching for a teenager who's having a powerful emotion, and I want you to think, this is my chance to build a strong connection with that young person. Okay, I'm gonna tell you exactly what your job is, and it comes down to two words. Easy to say, hard to do. When you get to be with a teenager who is in distress in any capacity in your life, your job is to be a steady presence. That's what we try to do. Okay, why do you have to do this? Couple reasons. The first reason is that teenagers are watching us to know how upset they should be. The nature of adolescent emotions is that they're very, very potent. They're actually more powerful than the emotions little kids have and they're more powerful than the emotions adults have. So once a young person hits like 12, 13, 14, their emotions start to become very, very amplified. It's just a neurological phenomenon. And so they take things in and they get very upset and then they bring them to us and they're watching to see if we get as upset as they do. We can't. This is where we have to be a steady presence. Because here is why. If a teenager has a breakup or fails something or doesn't get something they desperately want and they're incredibly upset about it and they bring it to us and we get just as upset as they are, the way they take that in is, ah, oh, I thought this was like a 15 year old size problem and apparently this is a 52 year old size problem, right? We don't wanna give them that impression. We want to help them keep it in bound. The other reason why we want to be a steady presence in the face of adolescent emotionality, and this is how we're gonna build our strong connections with them, is that our ability to tolerate distress in teenagers is actually the very thing that builds their ability to tolerate distress in themselves. Okay, why do teenagers need to be able to tolerate distress in themselves? The main reason I will give you at this point is that being able to tolerate distress, knowing that one can get upset and find one's way through it, is actually what makes teenagers independent in the world. A teenager who knows that they can get into a situation that is difficult and uncomfortable and find their way, whether it's they sign up for a class and they don't like the class, or they go do something for the summer that turns out to be lousy, if they know they can sign up for all sorts of things and try out all sorts of things, and if they get there and it's not great, they've got themselves, they can do all sorts of things. Teenagers who don't have that confidence in themselves, don't believe that if I get into a bad situation, I can get myself through it, actually end up on very narrow paths. They can do very little. They need to be guaranteed comfort, which is something we can almost never guarantee. So part of why, actually mostly why, we wanna help teenagers learn to tolerate and work their way through distress is so that they can actually have autonomy in the world. Okay. So when psychologists get to this business of helping teenagers tolerate distress and really thinking about what it involves, we actually think about it as a two-part process. So just to recap, we can't prevent distress in teenagers, we can't make it go away quickly, we can help them regulate, and the regulation actually is two-sided. Sometimes we help teenagers regulate by expressing their emotions, and sometimes we help teenagers regulate by taming their emotions, by bringing them back down to size. Now, psychologists have always put these on equal footing. We consider these to be equally valuable. I will tell you right now, the culture is very heavily weighted to the expression side of things. And one of the ways this comes up in my world right now is that I'm often doing interviews, and often in the interviews, I'll get a question from the interviewer like, 
how do you get teenagers to talk about their emotions, right? That there's a heavy interest in getting teenagers to talk about their emotions. And there's value, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But whenever I'm asked this question, I always feel like I'm brought back to a meeting literally 20 years ago when I was enormously pregnant with my oldest child. Um, I was about to deliver her. I was in a clinical meeting with a senior colleague. I was about to go on maternity leave. We were like wrapping up, putting stuff in our bags, almost out the door when my senior colleague stops me and she's like, um, Lisa, do you want me to tell you how psychologists mess up their kids? <laughs> and I was like, yes, I do. I know exactly what you're talking about. And she said, they talk about feelings too much. They talk about feelings too much. The kid's upset, and the psychologist parent is standing there saying, oh, you're having a very big mad feeling. You want to talk about that feeling? And what she said is, there comes a point where you say to your kid, all right, you've been upset for a little while. What's going to help you feel better? And in that, she really summed up in this kind of throwaway phrase, like, sometimes expressing helps. And if it doesn't, what's going to help you feel better? So expressing and taming, working in tandem. OK, so that's our job. So we're going to be a steady presence. We're going to help teenagers express feelings. We're going to help teenagers tame feelings. All right, so how do we help teenagers express feelings? So for me, whenever I come up to the question of how do we help teenagers do X, right, whatever the X is, I always start with, well, left to their own devices, how do teenagers do X? Like first you watch them do their thing and then you help. So teenagers are great. They use all sorts of strategies for expressing. Often they will use language. They will just come up to us and say, I am angry, I am upset, I am frustrated, I am unhappy. What it's important for us to remember is this is what we want them to do. And I think that it's easy to lose track of that. And I can say as a mom at nine o'clock at night, sometimes it's easy for me to lose track of that, right? If like I'm like, in theory, I know this is great. At nine o'clock at night, I have a kid standing in front of me saying, hi, I'm angry, upset, frustrated, unhappy. Usually I'm like, really? Like now? <laughs> right? Like, okay. So we want to remember this, that actually verbalization is the high art of expression and the other thing for us to remember, and this is key, mostly all they want is empathy. Most of the time when a young person comes our way and lays their feelings before us, we've all learned the hard way. They don't want advice. They don't want suggestions. They don't want questions about why they didn't do something else. They mostly want us to say, I'm so sorry. That stinks. I wish that hadn't happened. So when they're verbalizing, that's our strategy. The other way that teenagers express emotions is non-verbally. And I will say, you learn a lot when you write a book. It really makes you dig into the research. It really makes you synthesize things. It really makes you think. And for me, the biggest lesson that I took from writing this book is to have a much wider and more appreciative lens for what constitutes nonverbal, healthy expression. Teenagers do this in all sorts of ways. And I'll tell you two examples that were handed to me week before last. And it was two moms, different moms, and they were actually both talking about their sons. And they both gave me nonverbal examples. And what we know, this is not entirely surprising, we tend to cultivate girls to talk more about emotions and boys less so. So not entirely surprising these examples came as they did. But the first example, the mom said she was describing her high school boy and she said, oh, there's this problem, like his schedule got too busy and it's turned out to be an issue because he used to come home from school and blow off steam by playing basketball for an hour and then he could do his work. And I was like, there it is, right? Come home from school, blow off steam, express the distress of the day, playing basketball, highly adaptive, and then sit down to his work. And then the other mom was talking about her 12 year old and it was a difficult divorce situation. And the little boy was upset, and rightly so. And he came to his mom and he said, is there something I can break? <laughs> and, and she gave him something, she found something. And I'm not proud of this, but I can tell you two years ago, I would have been like, oh, I don't know about that. You know, and now I'm like, brilliant, right? Brilliant, the boy is, doesn't have the words, he wants to express, he's asking permission, he doesn't want to do it wrong. And so I have come, and I think we should all come, to be vastly more appreciative of all of the ways that kids express emotion that brings them relief and does no harm, and to not so much always feel like, until you tell me what's wrong, I can't help, right? I think sometimes that's a transaction that isn't necessary. All right, then there's the business of helping teens tame emotions. And again, before we get into our part in this, let's think about their part in this. Here's what I really have come to appreciate. 
teenagers are really good at taming their own feelings. Their main strategy, I would say most of the time or often, is to use distraction. The teenagers will get a feeling back down to size by distracting themselves. I will tell you, I have come around on distraction. I, I didn't think about it that much prior to the pandemic, and to the degree that I did, if somebody had said to me, like, what do you think about distraction? I would have thought, oh, well, distraction is bad and focus is good. Like, what else is there to say? Okay, then comes the pandemic, and we all spend a year and a half distracting ourselves as much as we absolutely can just to get through the whole thing, right? Which is a good strategy when you're trapped. Then here we are post-pandemic, and I'm newly observant of all of the ways that all of us use distraction, actually, to regulate our emotional equilibrium. For me, I would say probably the most constant example is um, when I'm writing and I'm like, say, maybe working on a paragraph and I hate the paragraph and the more time I spend with it, the more I hate it and I'm getting frustrated and I'm getting close to slamming my computer shut. But if I just do a little internet shopping just for a few minutes, <laughs> right, I can go back to that paragraph and we can find our way through it, right? We do this all the time, teenagers do this all the time. What I can tell you is if you start to notice distraction in your own life, I promise you, you're using it, and start to honor it in your own life, if you ever need to talk with a teenager about their distraction, you're gonna have a much better conversation. Because usually we walk up to these conversations like, you shouldn't be distracting. And what I've come to appreciate is, it's not the distraction, it's the dosing, right, for any of us. And that makes for a better conversation with teenagers. The other place I will say we can help teenagers is sometimes to offer them distractions. And this also seems strange, but here's how we think about it as psychologists. Talking about feelings works until it doesn't. And one thing we know happens is that sometimes any one of us, but a teenager may, start to talk about the feeling or a feeling that's painful, and the more they talk, actually, the worse they feel, that they sort of start to spin and dig in to that feeling. Our technical term for this is rumination. A gross but um, actually quite accurate metaphor for this is picking at an emotional wound, like just doesn't heal, getting worse as you go. And the number one solution for rumination is distraction, actually changing one's mental channel. Now, if this is your kid, or this is the teenager you're making a strong connection to, and you notice they are spinning, 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 here's how I would recommend you introduce the idea of distraction. Say something like, Okay, usually talking helps, but the more we're talking, the worse you seem to feel, so this isn't working today. Let's do this. Let's come back to this tomorrow. I will find you, you know, when are you free, when am I free? I'm gonna find you tomorrow, and I'm gonna ask you about this. In the meantime, is there something else you could do with your mind, something that will pull your mind away from this, just to give you a break? So getting them to change their mental channel, but making it clear you're not minimizing or dismissing or shooing it away, you're just gonna come back to it. What is quite remarkable is that it is very rare in my experience that when you come back to the thing 24 hours later, the teenager is like, yep, it is still every bit as bad as I thought it was. Usually 24 hours brings things down to size. The last strategy I wanna think with you about is teenagers taming emotions by comforting themselves. Teenagers are great at this. And one of my favorite things to do is collect from teenagers what they do to help themselves feel better when they're upset. And they do a whole bunch of different stuff. They will listen to happy music, music that sort of improves their mood. They will take showers, they will go for runs. They will cuddle with their pets. That's probably the number one answer I hear, rolling around on the floor with a dog. But they also do quirky things. And I hear with surprising frequency, teenagers say things like, oh, I, I go collect all of the blankets in the house and I put them on a single bed and then I like burrow in. Okay, brings relief, does no harm, good by me. So teenagers comfort, them, comfort themselves, which then brings to what we can do, which is we can comfort teenagers too. And again, it may not be that they wanna talk. And again, we have to widen the lens of how we help teenagers with their emotions. And if they're not in the mood to talk or talking isn't helping, we have an entire second category of how we help them. And taming through comforting is a beautiful thing. Here's the thing I want you to know about comforting a teenager it often doesn't take so much. The reality for teenagers is that their emotions are more powerful, and this is true both of their negative emotions, but also of their positive emotions. And I don't know if you remember, but I remember being a teenager 
and like pleasures being so vivid. Like what I remember when I was 15, I had a, a job as a bus girl because I wanted to buy myself a car and I made enough money to buy myself a $900 1979 Volkswagen diesel rabbit in 1986. It was white. I loved it and it was mine. And I grew up in Colorado and I have such vivid memories of um, driving that car in the beauty of Colorado with the windows down and music playing. And like thinking about it now, like I can remember it was like, I was like vibrating with delight at 16. At 52, I cannot recapture that, right? Like I just drive, <laughs> I go places. But if you can plug into that, you can remember that the teenager in front of you who's upset, who may not want to talk and may need comfort, it can be things like, do you want takeout from your favorite place? Or do you want me to go get the dog? Or do you want to go watch Phineas and Ferb together, right? Little things go a long way with teenagers and we don't want to underestimate that. Okay, so here's where I'm going to wrap up. We are in an adolescent mental health crisis. There is a lot to worry about. But I want to go back to the one thing, the one thing that I want you to remember from tonight, which is the single most powerful force for adolescent mental health is strong relationships with caring adults. You are all caring adults, and I am so grateful that you've spent this time with me to think about teenagers. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Damore. Wow, uh, you've given us so much to think about, as, as usual, in that thoughtful and timely presentation. Hi, everyone, good evening. I'm Gabriella Celeste. I'm the policy director at the Schubert Center. And I have the honor of introducing um, and inviting Habib, Habiba Rashid Grimes to join us on stage to share some of her reflections and do some deeper exploration of these concepts and conversation with, with Lisa. But first, I do wanna say a few words of introduction because Habiba is truly a local um, treasure. She has made serving our most vulnerable children in her, her life's work as the, a community leader, but also the CEO of PEP, Positive Education Program. She leads a staff there of 450 who support healing in children who've experienced significant adversity and mental health challenges. Her passion is fostering culturally affirming and healing-centered practices at PEP and beyond. She's a sought after public speaker and trainer in her own right here in Ohio and nationally. She's created the No Crystal Stare podcast. I encourage you to listen to it where she hosts intimate and provocative conversations with black women about the experience of mothering black sons, drawing on her own life as a parent of two young sons herself. I'm not gonna go into all of her civic engagements. I know we wanna to listen to them, but I do wanna say she's been recognized by Crane's Cleveland Business as a 40 under 40 honoree. She's recently received Cleveland State University's Distinguished Alumni Award where she, from where she holds a master's degree in clinical um, counseling psychology and a specialist degree in school psychology. And I just wanna say finally on a personal note, which I share knowing how much this fuels her life calling, Habiba grew up witnessing her brother struggle with severe childhood and adult mental health challenges and sees her service as a tribute to his memory. As a personal admirer of Habiba's, the Schubert Center is deeply grateful to have her join us tonight to help us unpack some of what we've heard from Dr. Damore and to listen to them both in conversation so we can better, get, better integrate these practices into our own lives, as Lisa said, as caring adults for these young people that we want to be in caring connection with. Please join me in welcoming them both tonight in conversation. Thank you, Gabriella, for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Damore, for this book and for your comments. And thank you all for being here tonight. I've been invited to share some reflections and what I'd like to do is just share an expression of gratitude to you, Dr. Damore. You brought and bring a level of regard and respect for teenagers that I've not experienced in my career. Most folks hear the word teenager and they wanna walk in the other direction. 
it's a special community of folks who choose to work in service to them. And I can say in um, serving young people with some complex developmental and mental health needs, there's not enough of them for any tier in that kind of public health triangle that you shared with us. So it is an honor to know that we here in Northeast Ohio have such an expert and in, in to be in community with us. I also want to acknowledge that the experiences of, of, in, of teenagers in our community are variable, not just by way of the unique makeup of every child, but as you alluded to in your talk, their lived experiences, black, brown, LGBTQ+, gender expansive youth. There's some vulnerabilities there for those young people that require our special attention. And, and for those who have not yet read the book, I'm, I'm excited and grateful again mm -hmm. that you call out some of those experiences and the unique experiences that those young people are confronting that um, make their experiences with stress and distress uh, more complicated for adults to manage. And I have to say to the strength based way you talk about young people and, and teenagers is something that we can all take away as what I think of as a universal precaution. When you lifted up that notion of public health, that came to mind. What you're offering us in your comments is this ab ability to apply some universal precautions mm -hmm. and to think about young people and be engaging with them in a way that really normalizes the developmental experience. And then the last thing I, I wanna say and invite you to say a little bit more about is we often, when we're, we're talking about development, we're focused on the early end of development mm -hmm. as the most volatile or the most uh, critical, that period between zero and about four when there's all this change happening in the brain and we've all been really inundated with that information, mm -hmm. but not so much the critical period of development that's happening in the adolescent years. Mm -hmm. And I have a burgeoning adolescent <laughs> <laughs> and a, a child who should be in latency, but it's not so latent, so I'm not <laughs> sure what's happening there. Um, but I guess I want to just open up our conversation um, with uh, some comments about what is happening inside mm -hmm. the brain of young people, because I find in, in uh, helping folks to work with young people with complex needs, when they can understand a little bit more about what's happening with the architecture and organizing of the brain, it helps to close that empathy gap. Yeah that can exist with cha challenging behaviors. And teenagers can present with a lot of those challenges. And if we understood better the neurological processes, maybe that might help us take that breath, <laughs> take that beat before we offer our advice or before we uh, respond with our own dysregulation to something yeah. that's happening. Um, well, thank you, first of all. Thank you for reading my book. Thank you for your kind words about it. They mean a huge amount to me. Um, what we know is that adolescents are undergoing a fairly major neurological renovation. And probably another billboard I would get, <laughs> just like take over Ohio highways, would be that adolescence begins at 11. And this is not something that psychologists have done a good job at all of making clear to the public. And we've always thought this. It's not like we used to think it was later and then it's younger. If you go back to very old papers, they're like, we used adolescents, like ages 11 to 18, right? And we actually have extended the back end quite a bit. But the reason we mark the onset of adolescence at 11 is that puberty is underway. For most kids, even if it's not visibly outward, it is actually underway neurologically. And it's a pretty major overhaul. And what happens is the brain upgrades over time and becomes faster, more powerful, more efficient, the challenge for the teenager and for the adults around the teenager is that the brain actually renovates in the order in which it developed initially from the back to the front. And unfortunately for everyone, the emotions are in the back and the perspective maintaining systems are in the front. And so you have, depending on when the kid is hitting puberty, but somewhere around 13, 14, you have kids walking around with very gawky brains. And by that we mean the emotion centers have been upgraded. So the kid gets upset, they get super upset but the perspective maintaining systems have not been fully upgraded so they can readily be knocked offline. So you get 13 and 14 year olds who kind of have meltdowns or become very, very eruptive in their emotions. And um, it's upsetting to them, it's upsetting to the adults around them. Often, if you give them a chance, they actually will re-regulate. 
and, and that will solve itself often on its own if you don't react too strongly. Um, but it also, it's important for adults to know this and to know how um, un, unsettling it is to the teenager themselves. The thing also to say on this, while we're just talking about the brain stuff, which we could do forever, but um, you know how people say like, oh, teenagers, they don't have fully developed brains? Like you hear this all the time. This I don't, is not my favorite. This kind of grinds my gears. And here's why. Look at like the products that they're creating. I mean, like think of like, I mean, you want, if you go to like an art show of high school juniors, I mean, it's the most extraordinary thing you've ever seen. I mean, it's the most felt and beautiful and extraordinary or like the papers they're developing or the things they're creating or the programs they're making. And you're like, what do you mean they don't have fully developed brains? I mean, like in many ways, they're like much more in touch with the world than we are. What people mean is at the most technical level, when teenagers are upset under highly activated emotional conditions, they are in a juncture where their front line, their frontal lobes can be knocked offline more readily and that doesn't come fully into balance until around age 24. So every time I hear that, I'm like, no, they do have fully developed brains. They have brains that can sometimes be tipped off balance if they're upset, but the rest of the time they work great. Yeah. And I actually want to dig into a little bit more the adult regulation that is, is um, necessary in order to engage with that young person who's emotionally very activated and charged up by the way of this developmental process. You know, as I look out at the hand wringing that is happening around the child mental health crisis, the youth and adolescent mental health crisis, I have been questioning just how regulated and capable of expressing and controlling those emotional responses that adults feel. How capable have we been? We've been witnessing workforce crises in every space where young people are present. So that tells us something about the state of the adults. And as your book points out, parents are, are, are fearful. They're, they're not sure about what to do in instances that are kind of more typical even developmental experiences. Yeah. Well, so when we think about the pandemic, which I think sometimes we don't even want to think about the pandemic anymore, it was so bad. It's but, if over, we, yeah. it's, <laughs> but if we think about the pandemic, and we think about its impact on teenagers. So first there were the problems I articulated. Then the other problem is everyone who supported teenagers was themselves suffering, yes. right? That they were divorced from the adults at school who typically took good care of them. And by that, I also mean the security guards, the front hall monitor, the, you know, like their gym teacher, their, you know, extracurricular people, all of those adults, those adults were taken out of their lives. Those adults were suffering. And then their families were also suffering. And it's very hard for kids to outfunction their parents. And so, you know, it just was such a horrible confluence of events. Mm -hmm. So part of what we have to do is help sustain the adults and help the adults find solid footing. The other thing we have to do is we have to be much more clear about what to expect when you're expecting a teenager. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's been a move in the parenting, popular parenting literature, like if you just do all these right things, it's gonna be a good time with your kid. No. Like development is development. Development is bumpy and challenging. And one of the um, narratives I'm working really hard against right now is I feel like people feel, are often saying like, we'll know the pandemic's behind us when everything feels good again or smooth and easy. And I'm like, oh no, 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 no. I've been caring for teenagers for 25 years. Development with teenagers is a bumpy road. It has always been a bumpy road. We then spent a year and a half in a ditch. We are now just back on the bumpy road and there's a few new bumps thrown in like avoidance and stuff like that. But I feel like part of how we help adults sustain themselves in the face of adolescence, typical and expectable adolescence, is that they know what's coming and it doesn't feel so personal. Because um, I think when it feels personal, as it often does with teenagers, then of course you're gonna react and you're gonna react badly. But um, the middle section of my book is basically like, here is the map of all the stuff that your teenager is gonna do that is gonna be really hard to watch, right? And one of my sections, that for me felt very vivid as a parent is um, why your teenager hates how you chew, right? Like, like that's a section in the book. And, and that section, like for me, again, I'm just trying to be a good psychologist communicating what we know. That section in the book describes what we technically call separation individuation. Mm -hmm. But what I say in the book is like, 
until I was a mom, I was like, oh, wait a minute, that does not begin to capture how spicy this really is, right? Like, that is a very dry terminology. And that there's really, as I parented through it, I was like, oh, separation is anything that I'm doing that's like how she visions herself to be is unacceptable. Individuation is anything that I'm doing that is unlike how she visions herself becoming is unacceptable. Okay, wait, everything I'm doing is unacceptable, mm -hmm. right? And it lasts for about 18 months, somewhere around 13 to 14, and then it stops. Like, cause, you know, but again, like, you kind of need someone to tell you, otherwise you're like, what is happening in my house? Yeah. yeah. It, the, you need someone to tell you that, and you need to know, like, you're gonna be uncomfortable and that's okay. You know, we've all, pre-pandemic even, been inundated with the notion that you can manifest your way out of difficult things, you can uh, wellness your way out of ever having to feel levels of discomfort yep. or unhappiness that are off-putting. And you invite us as adults to be with the discomfort, be okay with your, your, your teen saying, can you go change? My friends are coming over. Yeah. Yeah. I, you don't look well. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, like, yeah. are you really wearing that? Yeah, yeah. exactly. No. Um, you know, and you can either like say I'm not changing and then your kid's mad at you and you're mad at them and then fine, you'll have dinner later and it'll be fine or you go change. But like, I really am working hard against the idea that there's some emotional Zen out there that we can get to if we just do all the right things. It's an important realization. You know, I just, I have to ask, what, how, how did the nugget of this book come to you? Because because the hand wringing over children's mental health, youth mental health started very early, pretty much as soon as the shutdown happened within 60 days of that, the hand wringing started and people started talking about tsunami of mental health crisis and all yeah. of this. And you somehow got a nugget to say, I'm gonna write about wellness and, and teen wellness and emotional development. That feels so counter culture oh. of, as to what was happening, I'm wondering, what was happening for you to, when that happened? Um, so for a long time, I wrote monthly for the New York Times and I wrote straight through the pandemic every month. And so I was trying to always anticipate like what would be most useful to families. And a lot of what I was writing is they're having the right reaction, yeah. right? Like that, that was so much of what I was writing. It's like, well, of course they're anxious. There is a deadly virus circulating. And of course they are stressed. <laughs> they are trying to do school in 2D and it sucks, right? I mean, like there's no other way to describe it. And of course they have no motivation because how could you? Like none of us had motivation. And so I sort of felt like I was using my platform to say like, these were all logical responses. Mm. And yes, they are all distress and pain and discomfort, but they're not pathology to me. Yeah. And, and I feel like that's a really hard, I feel pretty alone mm. in that messaging and even you know, the CDC report that was released February 13th, you all saw the headlines, right? In this really, really grim CDC report. I'm not in totally in love with how it got covered by the press. And a lot of what I'm not in love with is that what got lost in all of that reporting is that those data were collected in the fall of 2021, asking teenagers about their mood over the previous year and asking them if they'd felt low for two weeks or more from fall of 2020 to fall of 2021. And I'm like, how did we not get a 100% response? Yes, right? Like, the, I mean, the numbers were bad, but I'm like, they need to be contextualized. And what we need to see are the new numbers, Yes. right? And so again, like, it gets to that tension I was mentioning of like, we wanna be talking about the data and amplifying that there's a real concern, but I don't know that it helps teenagers to make the snapshot that was taken in that year, the narrative of what's happening for them right this minute. We don't know that that's a narrative. And anecdotally, I think what a lot of us see is when teenagers could go back to school, they felt a lot better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not everybody, but it made a big difference for a lot of kids. Yeah. Is it gonna get spicy with Dr. Murthy on uh, Wednesday when he, <laughs> you're in conversation with him? <laughs> so I get to talk with the Surgeon General on Wednesday at the, at the City Club. No, you don't get spicy with the Surgeon no General. Spice. No, no. Yeah. no. <laughs> but I think you, you, know, you raise a, an important point. It, it helped me to pivot a bit, mm -hmm. just to think about this through a lens of normalizing. Normalizing responses to distressing circumstances, but also normalizing through the lens of adolescent development. So I'm yeah. grateful for that. And, 
um, hoping this conversation continues and that the coalition of folks showing up to say, yes, Lisa is right. Dr. <laughs> Damore is on to something here is important. The young people who come to mind in, in, in light of that are black and brown, non-gender conforming young people who have these very long periods of distressing circumstances that they're living through. And in the book, you highlight some of what that looks like. I'm curious, you know, as a parent raising black um, uh, pubescent young people, what, what would you advise as our en engagement with, with your work in particular in this book? And are there BIPOC, non-gender conforming thinkers, thought leaders, researchers, who are starting to unpack some of the nuance mm -hmm. for us around black and brown and, and non-gender conforming kids. Let me take those separately. So in terms of what I would want families to take away from my work, what I will say truly is I feel extraordinarily humble about my ability to advise families of color about what it's like to raise their kids. Like I really do. And there's several points in the book where I touch on the experience of black and brown adolescents. There's a long section about the adultification of black teenagers in terms of its impact on boys and girls being different. Boys generally seen as more violent, girls generally seen as more sexual. And um, my view of that section of the book is I am not teaching black families anything they do not already know. That that section of the book is for my readers who are not black to try to come to terms with and think about our part in placing an undue burden on black adolescents. In terms of the emerging work, the work that I'm particularly interested in right now is actually coming out of Nationwide Hospital in Columbus on um, suicide in black adolescents. Because one of the things that we have become very aware of is in an upward trending universe of rising suicide rates in adolescents, suicide among black teenagers is actually rising at a faster rate than it is among teenagers of other groups. And I talk about this in the book. Um, when we started to see this trend, people went looking for like data on what's going on with black teenagers and suicide, and there was none, like absolutely none, that this had never been broken out as an individual group to study. And um, what we had been doing, which we do a lot in psychology, <laughs> looking at the psychologists, is we study a bunch of kids and say like, this is what's true of teens, mm -hmm. whether or not there is a representative group of kids in that study. And so there's a very good group down at Nationwide, um, led by a black scholar that is looking at specific precursors of suicide in black teens, because we actually didn't know what they were, um, and starting to get some early results. Unfortunately, what I will tell you is the early results probably tell us less about black teenagers and more about structural racism than anything else, because the kind of findings they're finding are that things like black teenagers are less likely to have a mental health diagnosis than white teenagers, but more likely to have a previous attempt of suicide. So when I read those data, I'm just like, that means that no one's paying attention to these kids. Like that's, that's what these data say. They don't actually tell us a lot about the internal experience of black teenagers. So it's starting on that front, but there is a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, one other data element to that was the, that a, a suicide attempt is likely to be proximate to some kind of major kind yeah. of crisis event. And um, figuring out how to navigate, like this is manageable yeah. and this is something that is so activating, we're concerned for yeah. you. And we try to prepare black and brown kids for the distress of life but it only adds to the, I guess, vulnerability and sense of vulnerability that they're feeling when we gotta prepare for car stops with the police yeah. or other kinds of interactions. So it's, it's unsettling and... Yeah. It is, you know, and it's, it's like, it's really like you try to be you know, careful as a psychologist to not make inference. Mm -hmm. But when I was looking at those data, I was like, is it that you, there's a sense of hopelessness mm -hmm. that prevails and then it just doesn't, you know, a single crisis can actually tip things over into feeling yeah. forever hopeless. I look to the universality of brain development for hope in these moments mm -hmm. and uh, the things that we can do mm -hmm. to uplift all our youth. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, thank you for this book. Thank you for 
distilling out these important factors for us. And it's an honor to know you and have this opportunity to talk. Well, thank you, Habiba. I feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for such a great conversation and this presentation and discussion. Um, and thank you, audience, for coming. For those of you who would love to sign, um, have Lisa, Dr. Demore, sign your book, we're, um, if you haven't gotten your book, they're out for sale. And we're going to ask people to line up. It's sort of a large crowd, so kind of line up in the front. And we'll do a book signing for the next 20 minutes or so. Thank you again. One more round, please. <laughs>